Welcome to your College Bound Kid, a podcast for parents, college counselors, students, and anyone who wants a weekly deep dive into the world of college admissions. My name is Julia. I was an admission officer at Haverford College, an outside reader for Emory University, and I currently work at Milton Academy, an independent boarding and day school outside of Boston, Massachusetts. I'm Lisa, and I'm a clinical psychologist and college counselor. I have a daughter in college, a daughter in high school, and a son in middle school. After 30 years in Chicago, we recently moved to North Carolina. My name is Mark. I'm a college coach in Atlanta and the parent of two daughters, Karis, a graduate of Davidson College, and she is the founder of the Spanish tutoring company, SpanishHelpToday.com. And Joy is a graduate of the University of Georgia, and she is getting her master's degree at North Carolina State University. Good morning, friends. We've just got a couple announcements here for episode 242, a preview of our interview, and then we'll, we'll dive right in. First announcement has to do with the University of Southern California, best known as USC. Now, this is a school that has had a unique approach to admissions for some time now. While most schools of their ilk and their competitors, private schools of sort of that sort of selectivity and resources, they offer early decision, they offer early action, they offer wait lists to students. Well, USC has not done any of that. No early decision, no early action, no wait list, and they actually encourage people to appeal if they don't like their admissions decision in the way that other schools don't. Well, effective this fall for the class of 2023, they will be implementing early action. So as we know, that's the non-binding, non-restrictive way of applying early and getting an early decision back, but you do not have to matriculate or enroll. You can still look around compared to other schools, visit. So that is a change for USC. Our other announcement today has to do, it's kind of sad, actually. It's um, the San Francisco um, Art Institute, which has been something that had been really prized as a treasure for quite some time. And the bottom line is that it is going to be closing permanently. And so we had mentioned before that the University of San Francisco um, had been merging and taking over. Um, and that deal looked like it was all set to go through. And due to just poor finances, and student enrollment and other complications, um, that is no longer gonna, going to go through. I mean, the Institute, which had been around for forever in the area, like um, really over 100 years, it's really been a very established institution, it had dwindled down to the point where there were only 15 graduate students. And so the University of California system had bought and made an investment with a private bank, $20 million in October 2020 to sort of keep it on its path to solvency. And it looked like the University of San Francisco. I mean, early this year, the president kind of raved about uh, what it was going to be like to have you know, the Institute as part of their offerings. Um, and it just didn't work out. Now, um, University of San Francisco has said that they are going to now be starting a few new degree programs, um, addressing issues that San Francisco Art Institute, you know, would have had. Yeah, here it is, 151 years old. I knew it had been around a long time. So you have a 151-year-old institution that just didn't make it. There's going to happen in this world of tight finances and school struggling, you're going to see more closures, you're going to see more mergers, and you're going to see more downsizing. And this is just one of them. All right, for our interview, hopefully you heard Ben Baum from St. John's, the VP of Enrollment, Uh, just a fantastic guy. Uh, And he has a very special school. Um, A number of you reached out immediately and said that was a great school, and I'm so happy to learn about it. Well, in part two, Uh, Susan and I ask Ben about 10 or 11 more questions as he does a thorough and deep dive into St. John's College, both the Annapolis location, you know, as well as the Santa Fe location. Listen and enjoy. You know, another question that I know I'm I'm grappling with, so I think our listeners may be as well. You've got the Annapolis campus, you know, you've got the Santa Fe campus. 
two completely different settings. I mean, I know you have an inner transfer program, but how are the two campuses different? Because, you know, the location always seems to impact a campus in some way. And so how are they different? How do they collaborate? What's the communication between the two? How does this whole sort of two campus thing work? Yeah, so it's totally fascinating. I don't think there are many colleges like this either. Uh, we are one college that has two campuses, and they're in very different locations. Uh, I oversee admissions and financial aid for St. John's College, which means half of my staff is here in Annapolis, and the other half is in Santa Fe. I traveled between the two campuses, and uh, just last week, in fact, we had the whole of the Santa Fe staff come out to Annapolis for our retreat. And, um, and it's a great thing to finally have everyone together to work together, um, not just as disembodied heads like I may be right now <laughs> on a screen. Um, we are on Zoom all the time with each other. Uh, but, um, but we really are one cause of two campuses, meaning that we have virtually identical um, curriculum on each campus. They're incredibly similar with just the m smallest differences. What tends to draw a student to one campus or the other is the cultural um, experience they're going to have outside of that. Um, both ca campuses are small, uh, 500 students on each campus. The majority of students, the vast majority of students are living in the dorms, they're eating the dining halls, they're part of the student groups. But in Annapolis, you're living amongst these colonial brick buildings and green quads. We're right on the water. Some of the more popular activities are connected to that experience of being on the water, things like rowing and sailing. Uh, we are in the middle of the city of Annapolis, which is this gorgeous historic city with cobblestone streets, and the U.S. Naval Academy is there. The, um, there are coffee shops and bookstores and uh, restaurants, and so it's this very lively center of things, and it's just a half an hour out of Washington, D.C., and so sometimes we have students who are drawn for that slightly more urban feel of things and the access to a much larger city. Um, the thing we're sometimes known for in Annapolis is this very unusual croquet match <laughs> that happens every year between <laughs> uh, St. John's and the U.S. Naval Academy, where we play each other in croquet and thousands of people turn out to watch this croquet match. And so it's really quite a quirky, unusual, fun experience. Um, and so these are all things that you can see are tied to the history of a campus that's been here since the 17th century. Uh, there's a lot of history, this colonial Americana history, um, and this location matters a lot to that experience in Annapolis. In Santa Fe, um, it is campus itself is perched in the mountains. We're in the Rocky Mountains. Um, and so um, quite literally every dorm has balconies off of it. And students oh. will just step outside of their dorm room onto this balcony and look out over the most dramatic mountain ranges and sunsets and kind of big sky that you'll find anywhere in the world. And that tends to be a big reason students are drawn to Santa Fe because they want the outdoors. And you, we have hiking trails up these, um, these some of the largest mountains in the United States right there outside of the campus. Um, we have some of the best skiing you'd find in the West. Uh, sometimes people don't associate New Mexico with Colorado, but in fact, a northern New Mexico where we're located in Santa Fe um, is really a continuation of that great skiing experience students often find in those two states. And so Ski Santa Fe is this amazing opportunity that's right there in Santa Fe. Uh, beyond that, Santa Fe is known for its art scene. And right. so students sometimes are drawn because they're excited about the Santa Fe Opera House. They're excited for Canyon Road. It's the third largest art market, actually, in the entire country in this uh, relatively small city of Santa Fe. Uh, and it's very um, interesting forms of art that sometimes are very traditional and sometimes very cutting edge. There's a fusion in Santa Fe of... Anglo, Latino, um, Native American arts, that really is a combination that we can't find anywhere else in the United States. And then there's these um, very unusual forms of art, like um, famously Meow Wolf. It's Meow Wolf. <laughs> it's a um, kind of installation exhibit of immersive theater in Santa Fe that was founded by a Johnny and it's become incredibly popular. Uh, and so this, the arts tend to be a reason why Santa Fe draws a lot of, of students. But these two experiences are therefore very similar curricularly. We're drawing students who are excited for this curriculum on both campuses and yet really different social experiences you're finding uh, surrounding it. And students can spend four years on one campus and most end up doing that. But in fact, um, quite a few students will end up wanting to experience the other campus. And you can go for a year or two. So you could split your time, if you like, between the two campuses. Do faculty members wow. go back and forth at all? They do as well. So there's always some faculty who are teaching for the year on the other campus. Yeah. And so usually, you know, two or three on each, each campus each year. 
And you oversee admissions processes for both. Is it similar criteria and similar admission standards, or is it, well, Annapolis has been established longer, it's more well-known, and so it's slightly more selective? It's really identical. Um, and so uh, students might be see themselves as a better fit for one campus or the other um, because of those kind of cultural ca- characteristics outside of the curriculum. But the process, the selectivity is really very similar between the two campuses. And so we encourage students to apply just to one campus or the other. And if they change their mind at any point in the process, we're happy to switch them. And so sometimes we have students <laughs> who apply who get halfway through the admissions process and they say, oh, no, I've changed my mind. It's really the other campus I want. We've had students who have changed their mind, I think, up to three times before the moment of actual (laughs) matriculation. Uh, So that happens, and that's okay. And we work very closely together to make sure that's a seamless transition for them. And then, like I said, more students will come and do a freshman year in Annapolis or in Santa Fe and decide they just want to try their sophomore year on the other campus. And so we allow that as well. Nice to have options. This question comes from Dr. Lisa Ruff, who's one of our six co-hosts, four-year college-bound kid. And and she says, when I look at a curriculum of of um, historical books, I see a lot of old dead white men. And I want to know how diverse voices get incorporated into the curriculum. That is a really good question and one we talk about all the time. Uh, I, I think where I like to start in, in thinking about this is sometimes people talk about the great books. And, um, and actually, I think that's a mistake we at St. John's aren't thinking about the great books. We're thinking about great books. <laughs> and, um, and the distinction there is really important. I don't think there's some definitive list of the books that everyone should read. Um, there's far too many great books for any one person to read, and certainly within a four-year period. And, and in many ways, we're constrained by that four years. Uh, we, we pack it in with everything we can. And if we want to change anything, we have to remove something and add it in. And so, um, and so you see this all the time. Our, our faculty, our students are always talking about books they'd like to change over the course of each year. And, um, and how do we make those changes? Um, it's through this, this really deliberative process about what does the new author add? Um, sometimes we talk about, we have a mission statement at St. John's where we talk about the books that we read as being both timeless and Timely. timely. Right. And those two things, I think, are the the most important things to look for in any of these books. Are they a book, no matter when they were written, do they stand the test of time in that they were still they resonate with the human experience, even if it was thousands of years ago, like the Iliad, or it were just a few years ago? Um, and is it timely? Is it still reflecting on something that we are grappling with today? And as a result of thinking about timeless and timely, of course, we have to update this curriculum. And um, and you've seen those kinds of changes over the last you know decade. You've seen, um, particularly senior year, as we add in more modern authors, we read James Baldwin, we read um, Simone de Beauvoir, we read Toni Morrison, we read W.E.B. Du Bois. And so there's been a kind of infusion of more diverse, more modern voices um, over time. Uh, We also um, have a graduate program at St. John's, which includes on our Santa Fe campus um, classics from the Eastern world. We read classics from Japan, from India, and from China. And those are a graduate program, but in fact, inform some of the elective classes that our juniors and seniors are able to take. And so you start to see this infusion of other ideas that are coming in through some of these channels. But sometimes I think, sometimes I think the it's a mistake to focus too much on the books themselves. Uh, they're a key element of what we do, but they're actually only kind of half of what we do. We read the books, but then we're coming into the classroom and we're talking about them. <laughs> and that talking about them is also an essential element when we think about what diversity means within the community. And so, um, and so unlike a college where you might you know, sit in a chemistry lecture and have a professor tell you what you need to know in a particular subject, we are talking with each other. And the back, our own backgrounds matter in the course of that conversation. And so part of our mission statement is to bring in a diverse community that's going to talk about these ideas 
and um, and differ from each other and actually have disagreements, civil disagreements, <laughs> but real disagreements. And um, and so one of the things that I think find remarkable at St. John's and one of the things I'm charged with is the incredible diversity you find amongst our students. And that's a kind of broad diversity. We have about 20% of our students right now who are Pell recipients. We have about 30% who identify as students of color. Um, by some measures, we have more than 40% of students who identify as part of the LGBTQ plus community. We have students of all different faith backgrounds, no faith backgrounds. We have students um, of different political persuasions. About 15% of our students are international students. So we draw this very broad group of people together for the purpose of having this conversation about really tough ideas. And the diversity of that conversation, the people having that conversation, I think matters just as much as the diversity of the authors that they're reading and talking about, too. No, that was very yeah, well said, boy. and I really appreciate Sign me uh, up. the way, yeah, the way you articulated that. That was powerful. I do have a hard question, so I can't ha- have an interview without having a hardball question. Weren't those hard so enough? I don't know. My- <laughs> no, that was like, uh, you know, that was like the junior high level. <laughs> this is like the AP level. So, so there was a student that I, I'm actually working with her now. And, and um, what she was articulating to me is exactly what you offer. And so I, I you know, I recommend it, you know, uh, St. John's to, to her and, and she got really excited at first, but she, she started interacting with multiple students, this is her account, and she thought there was an intellectual arrogance. She thought there was a, I'm smarter than you, I'm look how more we- more well-read and more learned uh-huh. I am. And I wonder if you feel that's a challenge, you know, that the school has and has to guard against, or do you think that maybe she just interacted with the wrong, you know, four or five people? I mean, there's a little bit of everyone on any college campus. And so maybe that she mm-hmm. found you know, not the right people for her yeah. to have that conversation with. That's possible. I, I do, mm-hmm. you know, I do think you see this, particularly amongst our freshmen who oh, arrive wow. um, thinking, I've been admitted to St. John's College. I'm going to read these greatest books ever written. I am this intellectual. <laughs> um, and, and, um, and I think it takes, it takes actually some time freshman year to be in a classroom, um, maybe with people who have had experience in their high schools in a classroom discussion where they were the leaders of that discussion. Maybe they were on debate teams in high school and they come in with a particular perception of what it means to be in a discussion. And, um, and what they learn sometimes the hard way is that they're not the smartest person in the room, (laughs) that, that speaking is not actually as important as listening to the person across the table from you. And, um, and as a result, you could have a seminar in the beginning of freshman year where it's, it can be rough where students are talking over each other, where the tutor is trying to guide students and they haven't figured it out yet, where there is that kind of arrogance a student might have as someone who's new to the community and talking about Plato. And that seems like something that's very sophisticated. <laughs> and, um, and over time, I think they develop, uh, and this is one of the great skills they develop, they develop a humility about their place in the world having read thousands of years of people who are smarter than all of us <laughs> and, um, and discussing this with people who, um, who are just as brilliant as they are and maybe they hadn't met them yet. And so, um, so I've, I've heard this before, but I actually think this is part of the evolution, the really good evolution that you see with Johnny's from the beginning of their freshman year to who they turn into by the time they're seniors. That's a, that's a wonderful right. description of that process. And, you know, we say, <clears throat> we say to high school kids all the time, you know, you may have a very high opinion of yourself right now. You're at the pinnacle of your school community. You are the closest to the teachers in terms of speaking the same language and sharing the ideas and processing information. You are about to nosedive to, you know, the bottom of the barrel where you, you, we'll go through that process of growth, self-assessment again. And it's, we do this throughout our entire life as we, as we move into different communities. But I loved what you said, Ben, about the importance of, of listening and learning to process. You know, I found at my, at my school, the students who were interested in, in St. John's uh, were the ones who, and it was a boarding school, 
after dinner, they the one they were the ones who sat in the common room reading the paper. This was when people read papers, right? But they would read the Times and then they would read the London Times and then they would pick up the Wall Street Journal. And there there was this intellectual character that had very little to do with sophistication and and more to do with a um, d- a deeply ingrained curiosity um, and actually a lack of pretentiousness, the, this kind of sense that they were always looking to fill that void in their brain or whatever, their spirit of, of learning about things. And they, they, they were uh, as different from one another as, as they shared some of those values. But say a few words to the listeners who um, are in schools or working independently with kids uh, where we're, we're, we're in a way looking to help kids make the match, get colleges on their lists that they just shouldn't ignore, right? Help, help us. What, what should we kind of know? I mean, obviously everything we've been talking about, but um, think about being one of us for a minute and, and empower us. And we count on counselors to spread the word about St. John's. I mean, we are a small place. We aren't as well known as some other colleges. And so we count on counselors to help find those fits. And, and for us, we, the, the kind of kid who thrives at St. John's is someone who, who loves ideas. They usually love books, too. They love ideas. They love books. And they can't wait to talk about them. I mean, they, that's what they're passionate about. And, um, and sometimes, like I said, that doesn't always correspond with to how they performed in high school. I mean, particularly with teenage boys, we talked about them a little bit earlier. It's not unusual for a student to struggle in a kind of rote high school classroom setting with handing in assignments, with doing the things they're told to do. And yet they're going home and they're reading Shakespeare for fun. And that's actually what they want to talk about. That student can be a great Johnny. And so finding that student who is so excited about ideas and sharing that, um, that's the key element for success at St. John's. The interdisciplinary nature of the curriculum is also a big piece of this too, though. I mean, I think you're some, someone who loves lots of different subjects and doesn't want to have to choose one to focus on. That is often a good measure of what makes a good Johnny as well. And sometimes that's one of the hardest things to identify because when I talk about books, people often associate that with literature. And there's no doubt that kind of heart of our student body are those students who in high school loved their English classes. They love their history classes. Um, and yet we study math and science here as well in this incredibly different way than the high school setting typically approaches those subjects. I mean, our students are studying really the history of math and science. They're having actual discussions about the ideas of Euclid or Einstein. They are, um, they're recreating these experiments and then um, writing essays about this. And so um, what, one of the things I always marvel over is that student who came in perhaps a little nervous about math and science. They were always the English history student. And then they discovered math was their favorite subject when they got wow. there. And so sometimes unboxing people in too early to those subject areas, I think, is a mistake that students do themselves and sometimes counselors can do for students. But when thinking really about just the life of the mind and that kind of intellectual excitement about ideas, that's the kind of student who thrives at St. John's and who we're searching for with the help of counselors. Well, amen to that. And you brought to my mind a student from um, my school who was very attracted to St. John's. He he probably had one of the most significant math disabilities of any student I had ever known. Very bright, very bright young man, but very, very challenged um, in that area, was terrified. And a lot of colleges turned their nose up at him because they they couldn't imagine him being successful, even though he was probably going to be a history or, or philosophy student. They couldn't imagine him being successful. And he went to St. John's and he came back. I saw him some a year or some years later. And he said to me, have you ever read Euclid? <laughs> uh, Pythagoras? Um, you know, and, and he said, no one ever taught me what math really was. He said, no uh. one ever did it. And he said, my education would be so incomplete without this. And I just thought that was a wonderful way of expressing it. 
Yeah, I think that's wonderful. I mean, I sympathize to some degree. I didn't go to St. John's. Uh, I mean, I said earlier that I, I love history and I've, I've read a lot of the books that we read at St. John's, but I haven't read those math science books. And there's a missing element, I think, to a lot of our, our experience with the liberal arts. For many of us who had great experience of studying the liberal arts without that math science component. And so it's a really special thing that St. John's does with those subjects in particular. Absolutely. How, how, when you look back at your Amherst education and Amherst as an open curriculum, right? So you were at the time, was that true when you were there, you were able to construct kind of, you, you almost the opposite of St. John's in structure, but not dissimilar in terms of intellectual rigor. Uh, what would you have gained instead of going to Amherst that you would have gained had you gone to St. John's? Yeah, I mean, I, and I loved my experience at Amherst. I have nothing negative to say about Amherst. But there, they are, there's no doubt how different those experiences um, really would be for most students. I mean, the, I, I studied at Amherst the things I wanted to study, which actually have to align with a lot of the things that we do at St. John's, which is why hopefully I'm a good fit to be working in this role. But I studied ancient Greek because I thought that's fascinating. I want to read Plato in the original. I studied a lot of um, more ancient history. I studied a lot of um, literature. Those are things I found really compelling. And I put that together for myself. And I loved what I studied. And I had great classes with peers who were also interested in those things. But I think probably the most fundamental difference between St. John's and Amherst or St. John's and any other liberal arts college would be the shared experience of all students going through that together. And so, um, you know, at Amherst, I could get really excited about something I read about, you know, 13th century uh, European history, but I only had the one or two or three other students who were also interested in that with me. At St. John's, you're going to turn to the person next to you and you're going to find a whole community that is engaged in this endeavor together. And that's the way it feels at St. John's. It feels like the shared endeavor of trying to discover the world through these books. And that is really magical and something I don't think you find almost anywhere else. Wow. I had a couple of questions for you, Ben. Tell, talk to us about senior essay and senior oral. And, and then also talk a little bit more about the social life piece. You know, because, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about, I think, the life of the mind and the intellectual piece and curriculum distinctives. Um, are people, most people living on campus, what are popular activities? You know, are sororities and fraternities involved in the school, sports, any, anything at all that you can do to talk about kind of what kids are doing when they're not in class besides having intellectual conversations with each other? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I will address all of that. The, um, first of all, on the assessment side, um, what we do is also different from many other colleges. Um, our students do receive grades in their classes. But um, we don't give students their grades. If they want those grades, they need to go to the registrar's office and ask for them. Oh. And we do this on purpose because we don't believe that the point of assessment is to hand someone an A or a B or a C and have them just walk away with their grade. We think the point is to actually learn something so that you improve upon um, your performance the next time. <laughs> and, um, and so our assessments really are built around these orals. Um, and we call them Dawn Rags. It's kind of a uh, kind of a quirky, uh, Oxford-y kind of expression. Um, in a dawn rag, you sit um, with your tutors in all of your classes, and they have a conversation uh, first in front of you and then with you about, um, about how you've been performing in their classes. And it's this real in-depth moment of understanding who you are as a student across disciplines, across different faculty members. Um, and that's layered on top of the more um, frequent assessments you have, simply writing essays and sitting one-on-one -on -one with your tutors and having conversations. And that's a normal part of our experience, the idea that you'd get a paperback, you'd sit down with a tutor and you'd actually have a conversation about it. And so that's how we view assessment, which is also part of the reason why I mentioned earlier that St. John's has been test optional for over 40 years, because really testing has no bearing on what the experience at St. John's is actually like. And so those two right. things don't really go together for us. Uh, on the total opposite end of the spectrum is what our students do in their free time. Um, I said earlier, we are a really small community. We're, we're separated by a few thousand miles between Annapolis and Santa Fe. On each campus, there are about 500 students. Uh, in 
Santa Fe, about 90% of students will live on campus. In Annapolis, it's about 70% of students. So the vast majority are living on campus in both places. And, and student life is about that experience of being on campus. It's eating in the dining hall. It's living in the dorms. It's going to the coffee shops that are on campus. It's the dozens and dozens of student clubs. We're small. And so, um, so students are, tend to be more self-directed, I think, in the opportunities they're taking advantage of. And, um, and so you see this in kind of had the clubs that suddenly appear because there's a great amount of interest in them and then disappear and then reappear. Um, the more popular clubs tend to be the community service organization. Um, in Annapolis, we have a really active theater group called King Williams Players. I um, mean, Santa Fe, the outdoors club is appropriately for the location, one of the most popular groups on campus. Um, the intramural sports program at St. John's is incredibly popular. Um, more than half of our students play intramural sports. And this is unusual. I keep using that word to describe St. John's. I think it's appropriate. Uh, we don't have um, real intercollegiate sports. Um, we don't compete in any NCAA league. Um, instead, most of our sports are intramural competing um, amongst ourselves. We divide the whole college into five different teams, um, kind of Hogwarts style. Everyone's in a different house <laughs> and everyone competes against each other in all sorts of sports. Um, but the notion behind what we do is that this is all amateur. Uh, you could be a great athlete. You could be the worst athlete in the world. You are welcome on that team. You are welcome to play. And, um, and we think that's part of the community experience of being on our campuses. The only intercollegiate sports we have are done rather informally. Things like croquet, which I mentioned earlier, an unusual sport that we play um, against the Naval Academy. And in the past, we've actually held the, the championship title for, of national croquet um, champions in the entire country, but I'm not quite sure how many croquet teams there are in the country. Uh, we've also, but we also do rowing. We uh, we do sailing. There's fencing um, in Santa Fe. We've done archery in the past, and so there have been some less common intercollegiate sports we've competed in because the focus really has been on encouraging students to get involved in intramural sports for the fun of it, not for the competition of it. Great, great, great. Well, we're about to wind down here, and no first time guest gets away without going on the hot seat you thought you thought that was hard now it's the lightning round hot seat but it's more it's more informal but before we transition is there anything that you haven't had a chance to to say that you want to say i think um i think i've covered most of the bases the thing i would most want to reiterate to all the college counselors in your audience is um is how much we value you um because it happens all the time where a student is really the right fit for what we do at St. John's, and maybe they don't know it yet. And it's working, we like to work directly with those students, but we rely on you working with those students to help guide them, to let us show them um, how they could succeed at this college that does things so differently from most other places. And so um, I thank you for all your good work in that respect, and I, and I have my fingers crossed for more of it. Awesome, great. thank you. Well, you've really done a great job of articulating difference and you know, it's it's nice to have a school that's so distinctly different because it really gives you a chance to stand out. So many schools sound the same when they describe their pitch or, or who they are. And uh, one thing you do not have a challenge with a difficulty doing, which is showing how you're unique because you just are. And and I think that's great because there's there's a kid. Susan, I know there's a kid that just can't get it. You can't get their head out of a book. And then they also want to discuss it. And, and, um, that, that you could just see that kid is just going to be in heaven at a place where they can read and talk. I can imagine you, you guys produce quite a few attorneys because that's a, that's a, a lot of breeding ground for that, right? Like to, to read and think and, and communicate like that. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, we do. There's, there's no doubt about it. We have produced a lot of lawyers, a lot of journalists, mm -hmm. a lot of teachers, probably mm -hmm. teachers, probably more than any of those categories, mm -hmm. but but in all of those areas, there's a natural connection between what we do at St. John's and, and the professional world. Good stuff. All right. First question for you. If you had to live in another country besides the United States, where would you live and why? Ooh. Oh, there's so many good choices. I love to travel. And, um, and, and so in the one hand, I want to be perhaps um, a little, a little boring in this respect and say, I mean, I love the UK. I've lived there in the past. I would 100% percent 
live there again. But then again, I'd also do kind of more fun, unusual things. My family um, comes from Estonia and, oh. um, and I've visited before, but I would love to spend more time in Estonia. I think that's a fascinating place. Wow. That is really cool. So somebody visits, I'll, I'll pick Annapolis because that's where you're located, uh, to visit your school. What's the restaurant you recommend they check out? So many good ones. In Annapolis, so I have to answer this both for Annapolis and Santa Fe. In Annapolis, sure. yep. that's even better. You have, you have to get crab cakes. I mean, that's the thing when sure. you're in Annapolis. And so Harry Brown's is kind of like the local place right by campus where everyone likes to go to get crab cakes. That is kind of the, the one thing you need to do when in Annapolis. In Santa Fe, there are so many good choices. One of my favorites is this amazing French bakery um, where you go in the mornings um, called Clafouti. That's great. And then there's another place called Radish and Rye which is really famous for kind of modern interpretations of New Mexican food, but then also their bourbon-based drinks. And so those two things together, oh. that would be the reason to go there. Cool. cool. Wonderful. What's the lowest grade you ever got in school and what in what class? It could be from oh, middle, no. school, uh, middle school up. <laughs> we know you got an M or so. Little... So, so it's probably an A minus. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little type A. <laughs> I um I you know, I actually do know the answer to this question. I, I got a B once. <laughs> and, I, and that B, I somewhat proudly would say was B was in a um, was in a constitutional law class I took at Amherst before I went to law school. Oh my um, gosh. And uh but that was a, that was a long time ago. Hopefully, I've improved since then. Since I had to go through the whole law school experience. <laughs> Did your world <laughs> cave in getting a B? <laughs> you know, you know what it's like for, for those type A of us. Hey, you survived. <laughs> it was a rough experience <laughs> that is still in my memory too. I mean, it's been a long time. Cool. You're driving. What's your biggest pet peeve on the road with drivers? Oh, that's easy. I'm from Massachusetts, and um, and I drive safely but aggressively and in maryland um there are two things that drive me nuts one is they love to drive on the left hand passing lane and not pull over and so oh. you have to drive around them uh that's one thing that drives me nuts the other thing that drives me nuts which is and this is entirely fair uh, in massachusetts we might be aggressive drivers but when someone steps into that crosswalk we slam on the brakes and here there's a too much of this trying to drive around us in the crosswalks. And that is probably my biggest pet peeve. Wow. <laughs> that, that would get on your nerves. You could have lunch with anybody alive or dead. Who are you picking? Oh, but they wouldn't be dead when I'm you a, had lunch with them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I'm a, I like, I, like I've said, I'm a history buff. I would have to choose Henry the eighth. Oh, oh my gosh. And, that, and why? <laughs> I spent uh, I spent a good amount of my time in grad school studying the reign of Henry VIII in the 16th century in England, and I just think he, he is that period is a fascinating period of our understanding the kind of rise of England, the um, the real challenges around religion, um, the Enlightenment, um, just a moment of this creation of great literature. Um, there's so many fascinating things happening in that moment in history. And, um, and I have a feeling Henry VIII would not only be able to shed light on that, but he'd also be an utterly fascinating, fun person to be eating with. <laughs> hey, that's he the icing well, on too. the cake. That's the, yeah, that's the icing on the cake. So this one will probably really be hard for you because you like to read so much. What's a book you've read that's had a great impact on your life that you think everybody should read? That is a that is a loaded question for someone who works at St. John's. I know. Um, <laughs> That's why I knew it was a toughie. <laughs> the, I mean, there are some books that just go back forever. This is cheating. I'm going to give you multiple answers. Um, the, <laughs> That's okay. There are some books that you know that are just classics that are so important. I mean, I I fell in love reading Virgil's Aeneid. I fell in love with um, with Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert. You can, there's actually versions of Madame Bovary right behind me. I'm, on this bookshelf here. Um, more recently, um, it, more recently, it is on um, Pride Month, and so I just reread um, Giovanni's Room by James Baldwin. Um, but probably my favorite of all, particularly modern literature, uh, Alan Hollingsworth's um, Line of Beauty. The Line of Beauty would probably be my favorite book I've read in any recent year. 
I wow. see why they hired you. You are totally f- fit the St. John's mold there. He gave me four <laughs> books. <laughs> Dude, I cheated right, a little bit. But right on point. <laughs> right on point. And the last question, what is your um, advice for three groups, students, parents, and college counselors? Ah. I think, frankly, for all three of those groups, um, I think, you know, especially for someone working at a place like St. John's, different, a little off the beaten path, um, it's opening up your mind to the, the huge possibilities in American higher education, which I think is so essential. Um, there are so many places that are the places that everyone knows. Um, I can walk into a high school and there'll be a hundred people who turn out to go to that one big school where the, it's a name brand and people are excited for it. And the students are excited for it. The parents are excited for it. The counselors encouraging them to go. And yet that school isn't the right fit for all of those students. And, um, and so, so, often, um, so often that idea of fit, I think it's lost in the scheme of, of what's the most prestigious, what's the most name brand recognition, what's maybe just local. And, and I think that really is something I've taken to heart working for a place like St. John's because I see these students where I think I know that kid is the one who's going to succeed here. And, um, and what they need is the opportunity to explore this place, to visit campus, to sit in a seminar, to do our summer program. We have a great um, summer academy for high school students. And frequently it's getting that student who's skeptical maybe about St. John's um, to consider a summer program where suddenly their eyes are opened up to the kind of magic that can happen at this college that doesn't happen everywhere else. And that's not a criticism of anywhere else, but they do different things than we do. Um, getting people to open up their eyes to that, to explore these um, very different places that are, could be the right fit, even if they're not the name brand institution they thought would be the right fit. That I think is my biggest piece of advice for actually for all three of those groups. Well outstanding. Put. Absolutely well outstanding. You know, Ben, I was going to just ask you to, uh, first of all, thank you so much. I really appreciate this. And your answers have been great, uh, very helpful. And I know our listeners are going to really appreciate this. Uh, I was going to have you just close by sharing your website, but uh, I think this summer high school experience you mentioned is really important. It could be a really good opportunity for people to put the toe in the water and see if um, St. John's is for them. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about the summer experience sort of how it works, how long it is, and any details you want, and then um, share the website as well for our listeners. Yeah. So, well, our college website, which is a great resource, and you'll find everything on there, is sjc.edu. So that's pretty simple. Um, Our Summer Academy program, you can find by going to sjc.edu, or you can go directly to sjc.edu slash summer dash academy. But on that page, you're going to find all this information about are um, our six weeks of summer academy. They're in week-long segments. Three of those segments are in Annapolis. Three of those segments are in Santa Fe. Oh, um, you smart. could do just one or two of them. You could do all of them if you'd like to. Oh. But the idea is it's a full immersion in what St. John's is all about. There are classes taught by our faculty. Um, they are held just like any undergraduate class would be held, um, usually built around a theme. Um, so things like equality and inequality is one of the themes this year. Um, the title of another session is called The Heart of the Matter. Um, another is called The Art of Seeing. And so we put together an interdisciplinary array of the books that we read at St. John's. And our high school students participating in Summer Academy read them. And they, um, and they come to class um, ready to discuss them for a week. And that often is the thing that, that tugs on their heartstrings and that convinces them it's the moment to apply. But I'll also note for all the counselors listening, um, I have something for them. St. John's also has a graduate program, our Graduate Institute, and it um, allows um, anyone who would like to come and to do um, four semesters of great books. Um, We do it on both of our campuses in Annapolis and in Santa Fe. We also do it online. And then in Santa Fe, we have our Eastern Classics program, which focuses on great books from the Japanese, Chinese, and Indian traditions. And so those are great programs for any adults who are interested in exploring St. John's a little bit more. And in fact, we have special discounts, especially for educators. And so um, and so there's a lot of financial aid available um, for both the students participating in Summer Academy and for the counselors who might be participating in the Graduate Institute. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you. This was really, really good. And I say that from the bottom of my heart. And it's nice to, to get all three of us on together and keep up uh, the good work. And I'm very confident that you'll uh, 
should generate some some good activity based on this today. So thanks for coming on and giving more than an hour of your time to us today. Oh, that's great. I had a lot of fun. Thanks for having me do this. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, Ben. Friends, on Thursday's episode, I've got to get used to saying that. I'm so used to saying next week in the news. But on Thursday's episode, Dave is up to bat. First week of every month. It is Susan, the second week. It is Vince, the third week. It is Julia. And the last week, it is Dave. And we will be discussing how colleges quietly are fighting behind the scenes in order to keep legacy admissions intact. We will go into depth discussing why colleges love legacy admissions and don't want to give it up. But we will also talk about the case for giving up legacy admissions. And then I will continue a conversation. Um, I started with Lisa looking at what keeps admission officers up at night. And we'll start a brand new interview. And that interview is going to be with John Ambrose, who is the director of undergraduate admissions at Michigan State University. And this is going to be a three-parter. And so the interview ran about 90 minutes, so we'll break it up into 30-minute chunks, and you'll get it on episodes 243, 245, 247. And don't forget, college is not a prize to be won. It is a match to be made. See you next week, everybody. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. If you find this podcast helpful, please follow us and you'll get every single episode as soon as it is released. If you're interested, there are a few ways you can really support our podcast. You can click the share button and send it to your friends and acquaintances. You can help us pay our staff and our expenses by donating on our website. You can write a review for us on Apple or Spotify. I'm the producer of the podcast, but we have a fantastic team of 14. Shout out to our co-host, Dr. Lisa Ruff, Dr. David Williams, Susan Tree, Vince Garcia, and Julia Esquivel, and to our substitute co-host, Sylvia Borgo. Our sensational sound engineer is Nemanja Matvich. Our amazing music is from Victor Allen Weeks. Marketing designs are from Kimberly Blass. Lily Parikh manages our Instagram. Our image editor is Talha Khan. Joy Stucker does our website episode updates. And our webmaster is Stalianos Dimitriou. If you want to have a coaching session with Lisa or me, just text me at 404-664-4340. If you have a question you want us to answer, or if you have a recommended resource or article you think we should discuss, just send it to questions at your collegeboundkid.com. By the way, check out our website, where you'll find lots of content that is not on any podcast app. Our website is your collegeboundkid. Com. If you want to learn about other hot admissions topics, follow us on Twitter at YCBK Podcast. We think of you as our listening family, and we look forward to meeting again with you every single Thursday.